Hello, everybody, and you're very welcome back to another podcast. Today, I have an incredible guest. Today, I have Donal O'Leary, and I know most of you are familiar with Donal if you're in any of the networks I'm in. So uh, my path and Donal's path have crossed several times over the last number of years. And this show is going to be full of wisdom and insights and new perspectives. So if I know Donald very well, he's going to shake up how you view your way of seeing life. And um, so Donald is incredible. He's an incredible knack how he does this. So first, before we dive in, Donald, can you tell everybody, and you're very welcome, by the way, Donald, I'm really excited to talk to you. Can you tell everybody just a little bit about yourself, you know, your background, why, why you love this work, because you're really passionate about this work, I can tell. So can you give us a little bit of a background? Yeah, I would say that all of my life I have been philosophizing, soul searching, reflecting in one way or another. Mm -hmm. I remember at the age of 22, acquiring a new interest in words and language. And in hindsight, I, I now see that that was my effort then uh, to explain to myself what I thought and how I felt about the world. Mm. Mm. And words and language, um, Donald, is I love I love that you say that because we've literally I think lost the meaning of a lot of words and how we're speaking really determines an awful lot of how we're being and can you elaborate a little bit more about language and how we're using our words these days because I think we've lost an awful lot of that over the years. I think your use of words has got very casual and I think because of my upbringing I grew up in a relatively oral culture Mm. The oral culture and uh, where words were relatively important and and i think that that has increased for me that has increased in importance over the years does mm. 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 there's, there's something um you know the way our world is gone now at the moment right um that we're living in this really chaotic very busy everyone seems to be really busy um, and people are rushing around the place and there's a lot of overwhelm. There's a lot of um, uh, constraints. People feel that they just can't get to where they want to get to. And, and most people are striving for happiness. Um, can you talk a little bit about where is this overwhelm coming from? Why are we so constrained? What is it to be, you know, people are striving to be free. What are they striving to be free of? And, and what is it to be happy? Or can you talk about the two of those things together? They're striving out of their own pain. It's, it's a lot of it is avoidance. Yeah, denial. Yeah. If you keep if you keep running, you might never catch up with yourself. So. <laughs> yeah. I remember when I came back from America, saying to myself, "We are so busy being busy that we seldom if ever stop to think whether we're being what we're being busy at is of any value at all." Yeah, yeah. And other, other than avoidance. And a number of people will automatically say to me, are you busy? Yeah. In, in various networks. Yeah. And I sometimes say, well, business isn't all it's cracked up to be. And I leave, and I leave it at that. Very good. Yeah, I guess people think. I'm <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And because, do you know something, Donald? I think, and you're talking about uh, denial and uh, refusing to see, you know, and so many of us are hiding from our own truths. I think we're afraid of um, who we really are. And an awful lot of us are pretending and we're making up these stories. So we talk a lot about stories, the story that we tell ourselves and we make things mean something. Um, I think it's part of our ego um, that our ego is trying to keep us safe, obviously, but our ego likes to be in control. Can you talk a little bit about the ego and how that's interfering in you know us being true to ourselves i would call the ego an artificial imaginary construction <laughs> love it it's it's our sense of separation it's a kind of a rigid individuality and and it keeps us disconnected and while i'm on the word connection i might as well say that mm -hmm. I believe, I kind of know in my bones that we are not just connected. We are always connected. I love that. What we, what we do not need to do, therefore, is to connect. 
What we need to do is to see through the illusion of disconnection. Now that is powerful. Yeah, that, that is really powerful because we believe, at least that's what our perception is, that we're, we're so disconnected, but we've always been connected. It's, that, it's an illusion. That's, and again, this comes back to the story, the story that we're telling ourselves that we're, you know, we feel isolated and alone. And of course, being human beings, it's one of our needs is to this sense of belonging and to be part of, like in the family dynamics. Um, I know you're very passionate about, um, you know, how we grew up and, you know, the conditioning that we've learned along the way in families. And that conditioning can be, and look, everybody has experienced this, you know, so it could be in the family, in the in schools, uh, society, social media. Can you tell us why or what impact is all this conditioning having on us? Like it seems to be really um, determining who we are. Can you tell us how that's having a massive impact on us? The, the result of the conditioning is that we feel we need to be validated by something external. Yeah. By what we do, by what we have, by what we know, by how many likes on Facebook or wherever. We are constantly looking for external validation and it's never, ever going to be found there, ever. I love that. And what it reminds me of is children, um, you know, when children are growing up and they learn to walk or they learn to do something for the first time and mommy and daddy applauds them and goes, yay. So that's an accept, uh, being accepted. Um, and so children learn that oh, all I have to do is please mommy and daddy and I'm approved of. And, um, and as children, so we grow up with that. So we grow up rather than coming from a place of our own self-worth and our own needs we're fulfilling on the needs of our parents so all we have to do is do this so that our parents are happy and would you agree with that Donald um I, I've really realized that over the last number of years and I think that is absolutely massive because that's how from children we grow into adults and then we're in the job situation and then we're trying to please other people and we're forgetting about what it is in our own hearts that we truly truly need or want Yes, I would agree with that. I would suggest that our value is in our being. Yeah, in our being. That we're to be respected, valued and treasured yeah. just for being and for no other reason, not for academic or sporting success or any other success of any kind. Mm. And anything else is a breeding ground for insecurity for the rest of that natural life. Yeah, brilliant. And you regardless, talked about regardless of the qualifications, the successes, the money, the boats, the cars, everything else. Nothing, nothing external can fill that internal void where there's a perception of an internal inadequacy or void. Mm, yeah, because when we're looking out, when we're focused outward on our environment which includes the people around us and we're fulfilling on their expectations rather than what's important to us, what our values are. And like what you said in our being, Donald, so when we understand and when we know our values and so many people don't know their values, they don't know what they want in life. They don't know what makes them happy, like, like what makes you specifically happy. And most people will say, well, oh, if my husband is happy, then I'm happy or, um, you know, uh, depend on the environment. And then we say things like, oh, when um, when I have enough money, then I'll be happy um, when I blah, 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 fill in the blanks. So there's a like an expectation and we have an attachment to it rather than being right now in the present moment. So it's almost like we're living in the, the future all the time or the, or, or, or the past. Um, and we're not we're not appreciating the moment right now. We're not we're not uh, living our life right now in the present moment. Would you agree that that has a massive impact? I would. I can tell you that I have discovered for myself to some degree that it's possible to be totally happy for no reason whatever. That that happiness, that contentment, that security of a kind is not dependent on anything at all, not on position, possession, acquire, acquires, meant anything at all. 
Mm. Yeah, because so many of us, as you say, we want more stuff. We want more um, material things. That, that wanting more is an attempted compensation. It's a compensation, a camouflage, a distraction from mm. that internal void that I'm trying to describe. Yeah, it's almost like it's filling, filling in the void, filling in the empty space. It's, a, it's an effort at it, but it can never succeed. Yeah, yeah. It's like a plaster. Um, but, but even underneath that, it's, you're not fulfilling. Again, you're not fulfilling. It's like you're pretending. Um, you're pretending that this is what this will make me happy. But we always want more. So then if we get a, a lovely car, you think about it, the next car you get has to be one step up better whatever it's always we never we never downgrade our car and um, you know it's always we always have to have the next one it has to be better 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 all the time you know why is this are we keeping up with the joneses like you know as you say you know comparing ourselves to other people so again we're not uh, coming back to our own basic needs and requirements our values we're comparing ourselves to other people why do we do that we're always ranking ourselves against other people because it's our conditioning from the time we're born, practically. Yeah. Everyone tells us this. The world tells us this. This has been the case with human beings probably for thousands, if not millions of years. Mm. We are looking in the wrong place. Yeah. And the world tells us to look in the wrong place. And it takes a bit of waking up and some deeper mm. awareness to see that what the world tells us Mm. is not what to do. I have said recently, somewhat spontaneously, whatever the world tells you, believe the opposite Love and, you, and you'll be closer to the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we're bombarded, aren't we? We're bombarded with news and social media and it's just in our face. But you know what, Donald, you're right. It's keeping us so distracted. Mm -hmm. and really? And it's preventing us from having a minute like to reflect or you know go inward as you say you know th th there's a lot of distractions and, and I think that's obviously the purpose of the media wouldn't you would you agree I mean it's mm -hmm. there's nothing but bad news there when we're that distracted we cannot see anything really mm -hmm. we can what we think we see is a projection I would suggest that we rarely see each other yeah. Mostly, mostly when you meet someone, even people you know, what you see, what most people see, is their internal projection of what the person is like, rather than who is, rather than who is really there. Now that is that that's an incredible idea. That's something really profound to to think about. And if I can add to that as well, Donald, when we look at somebody. When we have a criticism or a judgment, and most of us have these criticisms and judgments, which is is blocking us again because we're all supposed to love each other and all of this. But when we have these judgments and criticisms, it's usually ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Isn't you, it? you cannot love what you judge. Love us. And that includes yourself. Yeah. I mean, when I realized that, Donald, I done many courses in development and all the rest. And um, that's something, that, and it took me a while to really get that. So when we're looking at someone and we're judging them, so the next time, anyone listening now, so the next time you're judging somebody, it's usually a reflection of yourself. Yes. Isn't that incredible? Because that's what you have. That's all that's present for you there at that moment in time. That's what you're afraid of or whatever. And it could be completely different for another person viewing, viewing that same person. Yeah. Different we perspectives. See we see through the prism of our beliefs, our attitudes, our conditioning. Mm. In other words, we do not see what is there. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm using a prism very intentionally because what does a prism do? It distorts. Yeah, yeah. And I have, I have found out in my own life as well in more recent years that it's possible uh, to see and experience life more directly than before. Yeah, yeah. And when we talk about reality, there's all these different dimensions because reality is different for everybody. 
everyone see it's their reality and we're all individuals so we all have our own realities like it's not okay I'm looking out my window now and I see a field and I see a, a cat and what have you and you know it looks nice and calm and what have you and it's lovely and I think I'll go for a walk after this talk but for somebody else they might have a different view of that reality you know and yes. a lot of that can be from your past experiences we all have our individual realities, yes, absolutely. But they're very, very subjective. Yes. yes. I, am, I am trying to point to a more objective reality. Right, okay. That, that is above and beyond that subjective reality of us individuals. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just profound when you start thinking about that. Talk to us about, we were, we were talking about education there. I'm just going to back up a little bit. Um, so, you know, we're all, we're educating in a certain way and we've got all these academic, um, you know, degrees and diplomas and what have you. What's, uh, and, and I know for myself personally, I was collecting certs and I'd say, I'll open my business. I'll start my business just when I get another cert. I'll just wait and get one more cert and I'll, then I'll be qualified. Then I'll be good enough, like, you know. And I realized, Donald, that I was just collecting all these things to be good enough, you know. Whereas I've had a lot of experience, I've had a lot of life experiences that I can share with people. And in this day and age, you know, our school system is based on learning, uh, acquiring skills, all this kind of thing, right? Learning and, and grades, right? So you have to get A's and you have to get B's and there's all this pressure put on our children. Whereas that's not really teaching them how to live life to, to you know, have a good quality of life, in my opinion. Um, what would you have to say on the education system, uh, Donald? I'd say, broadly speaking, education is about making us compliant. Yeah, yeah. conforming, non yeah. Non-questioning, obedient. Yeah. Units of, of uh, not of society, but of the economy. Yeah. I, I, I believe there are two broad types of education. One is what I call informational. Mm. It's just more and more and more and more information, more and more stuff to fill. To oh, fill yeah, overwhelm all the information on the internet now. <laughs> fill one's head with. And uh, the amount of data we take in has increased exponentially in, in, in the last generation. Yeah. So, so anyway, that is, that is what I call informational education. Broadly speaking, it's memorization and regurgitation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, which is what our, our mainstream education system is based on. Yeah, yeah. And the other type, I call it transformational education. This is more about self-knowledge. It's more about shedding light in what was previously a blind spot. It's, it's, it's the type of education that changes one's, one's take on the world, mm. how one sees the world, how one experiences the world, rather than just information. And you know what I can hear in that, Donna, something really powerful, is when we, yeah, you're right, we're so conditioned and we're brought up to conform and obey we're like robots almost so it's taking our power away from us yeah mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. what i can hear in that is transformation learning is really mastering who you are knowing who you are um and in that when something happens because life happens we do have circumstances we do have events so when that occurs in our life we have more control and power and we can respond more effectively so that it doesn't have as big an impact on us. So again, it's back back to our perception and how we view that. Yeah, so, we're, less, we're less affected by what I sometimes call the passing parade. Yes, I love it. Is, it. You know, the, the news of the day. Yeah. Uh, the shock and the excitement of it all. Yeah. But if one can pull back, so to speak, yeah. and see it, see it from a distance, see it more objectively, see it in the context of time and space, then one is much less in judgment and resistance. There's a, there's a guy called Adi Ashanti, and I'll quote, I'll quote one of his good quotes. He says, 
enlightenment is nothing more than the complete absence of resistance to what it is. Mm -hmm. I'll say it one more time. Lord. Enlightenment is nothing more than the complete absence of resistance to what is. I'm a big fan of acceptance and inclusion. Uh, I, I believe that to try to exclude another from anything is in effect excluding oneself. In other words, in trying to exclude someone mm. or a group, one only in excludes oneself. Yes, I can hear that. Yeah. And I love, love the whole conversation around accepting and embracing um, because, you know, I think an awful lot of our listeners can relate to this because we want to get somewhere. We want to have something. We want, 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 right? And in that wanting, and yeah, we have to set our goals and all this, you know, we need to know what it is that we want. Yeah, I agree. But where the problem lies is when we have this expectation, we're expecting an outcome where the best outcome might not necessarily be what you, the way you want it to work out. Mm -hmm. So yes, know what it is that you want. That's really important because you need to know your destination, but the journey along the way doesn't have to be kind of set out like enjoy the journey along the way and whatever pops up but but you still have that destination in mind but when you let go of the attachment yeah it's the attachment when you let go of the attachment of the way you want it to work out um and trust in the process it can be so much more powerful because when you're trying to be too control and your ego is getting in the way would you agree with all this, uh, Donna? I love this conversation. I think it's really, really powerful. So in letting go of our attachment, you know, trying to have so much control and so much ego in there, you know, so yes, plan what it is or know what it is that you want, but let go of the, the outcome, let go of that attachment. When we overly attach to a cause, including a goal or a belief mm. or anything at all, or a, a self-image, we reduce ourselves to a thought or a concept. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's, there's the danger. We are essentially beyond all that. We come before that. And that is what we're talking about are the waves in the ocean rather than the ocean itself. Yeah. I said somewhere recently that we are we're a wave looking for the ocean. Yeah, yeah, isn't that mad? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, actually, doesn't it? <laughs> if, I can, if I can quote myself from about 10 years ago, this is a thought I came up with. I said, I said uh, the, wave, the wave that knows it's part of the ocean is a happier wave than the wave that thinks it's something special. Love it. I, I, I know for a long time that the root of all our the root of all our problems at all levels is primarily based on our sense of disconnection. Yeah. You, you, you know already that I don't believe in disconnection, but it's our sense of disconnection. Yeah. We're our own worst enemies, Donald, really, aren't we? We're our own worst critics and Pull up all these limitations and blocks like Jesus, oh, yeah. get over yourself and embrace who you are and, and the powerful being that you are. Right. It's our efforts to self-improve that is one of the greatest problems. Now, yeah. personal, <laughs> personal development tells you about all these self-improvement projects. Now, if I want to improve on something, what does that automatically imply? You want to I'm, be better. I'm not good enough now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. I'm looking for something, that means I believe I don't have it. No, I'm not advocating a total passivity here. By all means, get things done. By all means, change things. But in that changing, absolutely, as best you can, accept everything as it is, without qualification, right here and now yeah now it, it this doesn't come from the head so much it's not a concept 
Oh, most of what I'm talking about comes from below the neck. Yeah. And, and I don't mean the heart alone. I mean the gut as well. Maybe even more so the gut. Someone said that the gut is the second brain. I'm, I would like to suggest that it's possibly the first brain. Yeah. Yeah. It's very powerful. And when you talk about the gut, I was watching Alan Watkins there over the weekend. And I know, you know, you, I, you mentioned or somebody else mentioned it. Alan Watkins, he talks a lot about the gut as well. And he talks about feelings and emotions. And I, for a long time, couldn't differentiate or distinguish. I thought feelings were the same as emotions, but they're not. Mm -hmm. Because so many, we all have emotions. OK, so th this is and it's energy in motion and the physiological, the, phys the physical, whatever, chemistry, uh, electrical or electrical beings. So all of that process in our physical body creates an emotion. So energy in motion. And so if you come up with a circumstance or something that you're challenged or threatened, you're going to have an energy in motion in motion in your body. But most of us deny that emotion. Most of us don't recognize that emotion. So we feel, we feel the emotion. And that's what feelings are. So I'd recommend anyone to watch that video, Alan Watkins. I'll put it in the show notes. But, but yeah, and then we have our vagus nerve, which is, and I'm not going to get too technical, but this is like a very long nerve that has a massive impact on our nervous system and it connects the, the gut to the brain. So it has an impact there as well. So when we have an emotion, that signal goes to the brain because obviously um, it's trying to keep our body safe. But when we don't feel that emotion, you know, that, that we're just denying ourselves so much. Yeah. So, yeah. In this area, the tail is wagging the dog anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I mean by that is we try to control and guide and direct and change our lives from the neck up. Yeah. Whereas everything is being driven from below the neck. Mm -hmm. So we are putting our attention, our focus, and our belief in all the wrong places. Yeah. And we do hold emotions in different organs and different parts of the body. And there's, and there's emotions that are so suppressed that we have been denying for so many years. And it's having an impact on our everyday life. The, the more time we can operate from the neck down, the better. Yeah. The brain has its function. Yes, it, it's good for making lists and good for making plans. Yeah but it's very limited and really has no wisdom. Yes, yes, I agree. And I just want to come back, um, Donald. So you were talking about how we are, um, that we're, per we're actually perfect as we are right now. So we need to accept ourselves right now as we are, because we need to be, wh when we accept ourselves, that's when we're more powerful. So we're not denying ourselves, we're not critical of ourselves, we're not judging ourselves, we're not thinking, oh, I'm not good enough. So we need to look, we're good enough right now exactly as we are. All our past experiences um, are messages, if you like, you know, for holding emotions or whatever. They're all messages, okay? And messages are good. I used to program on years ago and my teacher always said to me, error messages are your friends. <laughs> and I didn't get that for a while, but it's telling you exactly where the problem is. And it's the same in the body when you have an emotion and when you feel into that emotion and, and, and communicate with your body, what is it I need to do? Or what, what did I, what just happened that caused me to have this emotion? And if we operate in that way and we can have more power and more mastery over our body and our emotions, our feelings, our thoughts, our behaviors, all of that and our actions. So when we accept ourselves right now for who we are perfect, we have this completeness about ourselves. And that is when we have our full power. Yeah, I, I believe for a long time that facing and feeling is the road to freedom. Mm. And when I say facing, I mean not avoiding. Yeah, yeah, completely. And, and when, we, when we block our pain, we block our joy as well. Yes. So it's possible to expand the spectrum of one's emotions at both ends. The happy, the sad, and everything in between. Mm. In a way, it's a willingness to be with what is. Yes, yeah. To be with the pain, the anxiety, whatever it is. Mm. An attempt to escape is a road to nowhere. It only reinforces the problem. It's, it's rejection gives what you're rejecting more power. 
Yeah, you have more what's, power. What's, yeah. what's the saying? What you resist persists. Yeah, yeah. There's a great wisdom in that. It's used maybe a bit superficially, but there is great wisdom in that. What you resist persists. Yeah, yeah, it's really powerful. Yeah. So like when we have that sore knee or the sore back, there's usually an emotion or something like it, it starts from somewhere and it manifests when we haven't dealt with it. And yeah, some of it can be like, you know, you could bang your knee or whatever. But for a lot of the time, that pain can be something emotional for years and years that we've never dealt with. Yeah, pain pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. Love us. Yeah. We, we suffer because of our stances, our take, and mostly because of our rejection and attitude. Yeah. I repeat again, pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. Suffering is a response to your take, uh, your attitude to what is actually happening. Yeah, absolutely. And so many people are suffering unnecessarily. And that is my, I'm always saying that like so many people that have unnecessary suffering. And I, I would go so far as to say that all suffering is unnecessary. Now yeah. we're, we're humans. Yeah. But theoretically, at least, all suffering is avoidable. Yeah, yeah. Suffering <laughs> results from an attitude. It does. Your, your take on it, as you say, your, how you view it. Yes. How you view it and, and it's your perception, it's your story that you're telling us. And we do, we tell stories to ourselves. That's what, yeah. that's what we do. We tell us because our brain has to, uh, our, our brain is always trying to make sense of things. And that's, you know, that's the brain's job. But sometimes um, it's just overly rational and analyzing. And we're thinking from the, the neck up, as you say. So we're not, there's nothing's happening from down here. So, um, so we make up these stories that we have to make sense of why things are, how things are occurring for us. Um, yeah, and there's what happened and there's the story we tell ourselves yeah. about what happened. Now, the story may or may not be important. The real story is what we tell ourselves yeah. about ourselves yeah. as a result of what happened. Yeah. yeah. And what happened may have not, maybe, maybe no reflection on us at all but we still we still believe that 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 story reflects badly on us yeah. that we're flawed in some way yeah yeah and yeah. we carry that we carry that all through our life you know there's a saying that says uh, what they say now pain um, guilt is about what we've done or haven't done yeah and shame is about who we are or who we are not yeah and making a distinction and making a distinction there yeah and Branny brown does a lot of work around guilt and shame i'd recommend our listeners listen to that as well she's wonderful on vulnerability yeah which i'm a fan of as well yeah and it takes vulnerability to really find out who you are not to be afraid of what you're hiding there you know we're all hiding stuff it's an absolutely essential ingredient in going anywhere yeah absolutely and i mean to be vulnerable is not a weakness people think it's a weakness it's not a weakness that is what is exposing you're exposing yourself and you're not afraid to expose who you are because who you are is just beautiful and sometimes that exposure the primary exposure is is to oneself yeah and part of the acceptance again yeah mm -hmm. donna we're coming to the end <laughs> <laughs> would you believe <laughs> and we've gone slightly over but that's okay because this we've, is fantastic we've, we've barely started i know i know that i know it's like oh my god so yeah so donald listen god there's so much and, and i wanted to talk a little bit about parenting and we touched on that slightly but can you just yeah actually i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to extend this a little bit because this is really brilliant but parenting can you tell us what our job is what, what is the job of parenting um because so many parents I don't want to make people wrong, right? Because that's not that this is what it's about. But, but parenting, we're doing a lot wrong, right? But we don't mean to. We love our children. But how can we parent better? What is it we need to watch out for? I would say it's essentially to treasure, welcome, validate our children completely. Yeah. 
regardless of anything, regardless of academic or sporting success or anything at all. Yeah. We talk of, we talk about unconditional love. Oh yeah. Well, uncondition, unconditional love is the only kind there is because conditional love is an oxymoron. <laughs> if, if it's conditional, it cannot be love. Uh, now you remind me to quote Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me think now. Shakespeare said, what did, what did Shakespeare say? Love is not love that alters when it alteration finds. Yeah. Love is not love that alters when it alteration finds. Yeah. That's in one of his sonnets. Yeah, yeah. So like accept children for who they are, how they blossom and let their light shine. And, and have nothing, have absolutely nothing be conditional. Yeah, yeah, because... You know, you, you know I'm a fan of Dr. Shivali. Yes, and I like her too. She's part of Mind Valley, yeah. Who speaks beautifully on this subject. Yes, yeah, another, I'll put that in the show notes as well, because that is definitely one to watch. And I think, you know, our children are our next generation, Donald, and our world really depends on who they are in this world you know how it's going to develop how our world's going to be for our grandchildren our great-grandchildren so um I think parenting and I'm a parent I have a nine-year-old daughter and it's one of the most beautiful jobs even though I could kill her sometimes <laughs> but she's gorgeous and um and yeah I just think it's such an honor to be a parent and a privilege to be responsible for someone's life in their growth you know and not their physical growth but their their mind and their heart you know and who they're going to be for the world when they grow up I think that is just an incredible honor to have and really let your children's light shine if they have an interest in something if they're happy look look at what they're happy doing and encourage them like my daughter loves playing the piano and she drives me mad sometimes but I, I'd never tell her to stop or be quiet or have a headache never I let her be at that piano she is in her element and 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 that's what we have to do you know she's not doing nothing wrong you know, if, if I said this before, I think it's worth repeating. The opposite, the other side of the coin to that is having everything be conditional, praising the child when it's successful at sport or in school, yes. praising it when it does the right thing, praising it when it's good, when it's obedient, when it's a good little child, when it does what Mammy says. <laughs> I am suggesting here very strongly yeah. that. That is a breeding ground for lifelong I in insecurity. I agree. I and agree. No, no success, no PhDs, no money, no success will ever compensate, will ever fill that void mm. created by conditionality. Yeah, because you want them to have their own mind and not be operating from a place of, oh, if mommy and daddy are happy, if, I, if I'm good, then they're going to be happy with me, you know, and it's, it's limiting them. Like, think about it. Like, it's really, it's a big deal. You know, we're limiting our children when we say, oh, good boy for doing that or good girl, um, because then our child feels accepted. And ultimately, that's part of a child's needs. Um, so we can do that in other ways. And um, rather than saying you're good for doing that, you know, it's a very big area, Donald. This approach, this approach to parenting is revolutionary. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely. It's a, um, it's a total U-turn. Yeah. It's a 360 degree angle change. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 really, it really is. And look, parents think they're doing, you know, fantastic. And look, parents' intentions are, which is brilliant, right? But... If you get any message out of this conversation now um, is to have another perspective on it and how can you do it better and to be aware of this, you know, and um, really you want your child to be where they're blossoming and really have a look at where they are very creative, where they're having fun and let them be, you know, exactly. and, and don't no, have... one is, no one is to blame here. No, not at all. The, par the parents had parents who had parents who had parents who had parents. Yeah. It's come down along the long line. Yeah, and there's no manual to parenting. <laughs> exactly. And what, what we're talking about here is breaking the chain. 
of this mode of, of parenting. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's no, all we've ever known. I want to say as well that the parents who parent in this way love their children as well. Mm -hmm. But the conditionality of any kind. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's it. Is a, is a barrier and is, to repeat myself again, is the creation of insecurity in the child and for its, the rest of its life. Yeah. By the way, what I'm saying about parenting applies to adults as well. Yeah, yeah. This is what we all like, welcome and crave from other people. Yep. Unconditional acceptance. Yes. Mm -hmm. No judgments, no blames. Yeah. And there is no greater unifier than unconditional acceptance. Yeah. And when you meet someone with that lack of judgment, you pick it up right away and it's not verbal. Yeah. And it goes beyond words. They can say a lot and they can say nothing. Mm -hmm. You pick it up in the air and more particularly in the body language and not in the words absolutely i couldn't agree more donald we are definitely coming to the end here now donald i want to ask you one last question and that is if you were to leave people with a really actually before i go there where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you donald oh i have a mobile and an email <laughs> okay uh, it's oh eight seven two eight four five eight six four is probably the best i text okay. All is perfect. So you're open to people ringing in and having conversations with you? And... Absolutely. Okay, great. Great. There's an opportunity, everybody. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll put down the show notes then if that's okay. Which I don't know. I'll put your, your phone number in there. Yeah. Um, so Donald, last question. If I was to ask you to, to finish up with a very empowering thought or something you want to leave our listeners with to really have them be empowered and really be fully complete, accept themselves, um, for who they are, whatever it is, what would that message be to really have people empowered? I would say the real issue is not that you're inadequate. Mm -hmm. The real issue is not that you're not enough. And we all do to some degree. The real issue is that you're conditioned into believing that you need to be something. Yeah. If you can let go in some way, of the feeling, the belief that you have to be something in order to be okay, to be acceptable, to be lovable even. So that, that is my tip. Forget, okay. forget about feeling inadequate, forget about not being enough. Realize that your being, that just being is enough. That is beautiful, Donald. That, that's a perfect way to end this conversation. So there you have it, folks. Just being is enough. So accept yourself for who you are. And you are just perfect. You're just perfect exactly as you are right now in this present moment. Donald, thank you so much for joining us. And um, yeah, people reach out to Donald if you want to have a conversation with him. Uh, he, he, he is just incredible. Uh, we have regular conversations, myself and Donald. And uh, yeah, very, very empowering and very insightful. Lots of wisdom and and all that. So thank you, Donal, and we will chat to you soon again, please, God. Mind yourself and take care. Thanks, Joanne.